welcome this morning. Let's go ahead and stand and posture ourselves in a state of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and King Jesus Christ this morning. One, two, three, four. church how are you today all right hey we just got a few quick announcements here uh, first let's welcome our online viewers on YouTube and Facebook welcome good morning uh, welcome to our first-time guests uh, if you wouldn't mind there's a basket in front of you there's a little card in there go put your uh, basic personal info on there and we'd love to email or send you a letter and uh, welcome you to our church uh, just a few announcements today if you are signed up for the Thanksgiving feast it's gonna be here at church um, if your plans suddenly change, make sure that you let Erica McNeil know. She's going, man, there's a lot of work going into this. She's got to know if this thing's really going to fly. Um, if we find that there's only two or three families that are actually going to come to this thing, she'd actually like to host it at her house. 
So it's really important that you get in contact with her if your plans somehow change. Um, anybody into decorating? Hanging Christmas lights, hot chocolate, get to hang out with the lambs? That's the deal right there, right? Okay, so they're gonna start uh, Christmas decorating this coming Friday, which is gonna be the 27th. They're gonna start pulling everything down, getting everything ready. That'll, they'll do that 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. this Friday. And then the magic happens Saturday morning from nine to one. So if you've got even just a few, three hours, couple of hours, come on down, help us make this place look amazing. Um, we're continuing our student fundraiser. We're gonna be selling tickets out here in the courtyard today. Uh, come see us at the table. We also have an online option for buying tickets if that's easier for you. And then uh, we had a huge event called the Pie Clinic yesterday and uh, Shelanie is gonna fill you on how that went. Yes, if you were here yesterday, this room looked really, really different. We've had uh, 31 tables filled um, with women and we made some pies. Some of you have already eaten them. I pray that that has been uh, that that is and will be a joy to your families. But we just want to celebrate together um, what the Lord gave us uh, as a church and particularly as women. But first, let me just thank a few people. Thank you so much to the women's ministry team, um, to Jesse Lem, to Kelsey Laird, to Janine Kramer, to Therese Allen for the days of work and preparation that went into this. We want to thank Mark Burgraff for the video work that he did. Thank you to my husband, Robert, for the photography work that he did. Um, and we want to thank Bob King for the setup and, and Bill Parks and, and Michelle and Grace for the, um, for the outstanding custodial work. It was a, a big event, and we want to show you a little bit of the joy that we had together yesterday. That was up here on the stage. We had women of all ages, families, mothers, sisters, daughters, friends, <laughs> you can take us through those nice and nice and quick, Molly. I know I asked Robert for a few more pictures than than he thought was wise for the morning, just because I couldn't I couldn't help it. Look at these pictures. Can you even believe it? What joy! We even had one table. I think it'll come up here. There were a few moms, including me, who needed to bring uh, their little boys if they were going to be able to make it. And Janine Kramer hosted a table of eight-year-old boys out in the <laughs> courtyard. And they made pies. They came home with mini pies. I bet their picture's going to come up here pretty soon. We baked Benji's pie last night. It was fantastic. And Janine made them do all of their own dishes in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. So just women of all ages. Uh, and generations here in this room entering into that joy together. Praise God. That was the best. There they are. <laughs> there are the boys making their pies. So thank you, church. Thank you so much for, um, for just supporting us and allowing us to do that. It was a wonderful time together. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Psalm 100. This is such a cool song, you guys. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's sing with that on our minds right now. Let's stand and worship.
Man, that is beautiful. You may be seated. Wow. It's kind of nice to see this family up here. This is like way fun. And uh, I don't know, I'm telling you what, it's a kick to watch you play that bass player. I, I mean, it is. Yeah, that was just so fun. I, I said, wow, she is worshiping. I mean, it was, it was beautiful. And look at this down. Isn't this gorgeous down here? Man, did you do this? I knew it. I had, I knew it. I, it's just absolutely beautiful. And I got to say something today. Well, first off, I say, good morning, men and women of God. Amen. <laughs> This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. You saw all those things. Those ladies made all those pies, you know. And uh, one of my least favorite pies is apple. And uh, I never order apple. And my wife came, and she had the pie. And we don't even eat desserts anymore. I mean, we really don't. Last night, all of a sudden, I said, I don't know, it's weird. I just feel like a dessert or something. She said, you want me to cook that pie? I said, okay. So I ran to the store, got some Cool Whip, you know, actually whipped cream. I thought, I won't get ice cream because then I'll keep eating. So I just do the whip, and, and she put that, got the pie done. I put that piece in my mouth. I have never tasted something so good in my whole life. I said, I love apple pie. <laughs> I didn't know I loved apple pie. I felt like I was like eating a croissant or something. Like, oh, anyway, I want to tell you, ladies, you got to cook this up for these guys. I'm telling you what, it's going to be a, a super Thanksgiving. It was wonderful. Thank you for that great ministry for these ladies and, and the joy that was here in this room in the Thanksgiving. So let's present ourselves now. It's our time in our offering. Let's present ourselves before the Almighty. Father, we've come to rejoice in your presence. We're singing to you our grateful praise. We've come with thanksgiving and praise into your courts and into your gates. In the magnificence, we declare you are good. You are faithful. There is no one like you. You've given us life that is eternal. It will never end. You have given us peace in the midst of storms. You've given us a time of joy instead of fear and anxiety. We come to express our love and gratitude and thanksgiving to you all that has been done here on this beautiful day. We thank you for our pastor who you have filled with your spirit. We thank you that you hear, your breath will come from him today and that our hearts will be ignited in the magnificent love of you. So Father, we present ourselves and now we present our offerings to you with great joy, with great gladness in the magnificent name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.
this morning to praise your holy name. Here you are, creator of the universe, from the smallest particle to the largest galaxy and beyond, which we cannot even comprehend. And yet, you sacrificed yourself for us. Lord God, we, we cannot fathom what pain that you went through on the cross and taking the sin, our sin, upon yourself. Lord Jesus, you did that for us because God the Father declared that it would be so. And Lord, you are righteous in all of this. And we can't thank you enough for the love that you have shown us. And Father, as, as we go through our lives here on this planet, let us glorify you in everything that we do. When you give us bountiful things, blessed be your name. When you take things away from us, blessed be your name, because to you and to you alone is all the glory for now and forever. And we thank you for that, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Lem family. That was awesome. They are available for weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs, <laughs> anything that you can think of. They'll be there. That's pretty cool. Hey, you got your Bible this morning? Two, three, three of you brought your Bible. <laughs> Grab it, would you? First of all, I forgot the kids. Kids, get out of here. Follow Mr. McLaughlin right there, if you will. The rest of you, grab your Bible and open up to the book of Philippians, all the way in the New Testament, the book of Philippians, chapter 4. We are going to be looking at God's Word today, and I want to just simply say this, though everything in the world seems to be all messed up and screwed up, doesn't it seem that way? I made the terrible mistake of turning on the news this week. I, I have sworn off of the news because everything they're going to tell me is absolutely wrong and incorrect and horrible. And so I quit watching it, and I turned it back on just for about 30 minutes, and man, was I discouraged. But you know what? For those of us who are gathered here to mor this morning, for those of you who are gathered with your family at home, this is a day that the Lord has made. We are going to celebrate. We're going to rejoice in it. We're not going to worry about what the world is doing because Christ is ours. In fact, we're going to give thanksgiving this morning, and we're going to let the perfect peace of God dwell inside of us. Amen? Amen. Could I get my slides up on the screen, please? Thank you. So if you've got your Bible opened up to the book of uh, Philippians chapter 4, waiting for the screen to come up. Is it coming up? Here it comes. Ready? Open, 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 open. There, hey! It's a miracle. Thank you back there. Appreciate it. All right. Now, I'm going to do, the message is a little bit different this morning. I know that I'm different, so we're going to do the message a little bit different. So we're going to start with the end first. How does that sound? Okay, because this is where we're going. Here's where we're going. Here's what Paul says in verse 7. Turn there for just a moment. Philippians 4, 7. The goal of what he is saying this morning is this is where he wants you to end up. It is the promise of God. He's going to give you three commandments on how to get here, but first I want you to see what you're going for. He says this, And the peace, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's a promise. That's your promise this morning. You can claim that, that the peace of God, which is far beyond anything that I can understand and anything that I try to comprehend, the peace of God is greater, and not only that, but it actually guards my heart and my mind while I am in Christ Jesus. Now, please understand, the first thing that I want you to see is that the text says it's the peace of God. Now, think about that for a moment. This is the only time in the New Testament that Paul talks like this, the peace of God. Most of the time he's talking, he's talking about peace with God. And that happens at the moment you get saved, right? 
Paul says in Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. There is no longer enmity between me and God. We are at peace. The war is over. I've come to acknowledge Him as my Savior. He is the treasure of my heart. He is my hope. He forgives me of my sin and has restored me to a relationship with the Father, and so I am now at peace with God. But Paul is not just talking about peace with God. He's talking about something additional that happens to you as a believer, and that is to have the peace of God. It's God's peace. It's a peace that dwells in the Father and in the Son and in the Spirit. It is a realization that everything is under His control, It is a realization that there is no anxiety or nothing to fear. It is a realization that he is sovereign in all things, and he is not stressed out or worried one bit at all. He is completely at peace. And Paul is saying here, I want that to be in you. So i got to ask you a question. Do you want that? Do you want the peace of God in your life? In fact, notice how he further refines it. He says, it surpasses what? All understanding. What is he talking about there? See, sometimes when things go wrong in our life, and they do, things go sideways on us. As Gus says, we have opportunities, right? But here, Paul is saying, and how many times have we said, that when I'm in the midst of a problem or I'm midst in a struggle or I'm midst in a hardship, if I could just understand what God is doing. God, could you tell me the reason why? We seem to think that if we know the reason why, then we're going to begin to feel better because we'll be able to put it in context and rest at ease. But Paul says it doesn't work that way. In fact, you may not even have a clue of understanding why God is doing what he's doing. But that doesn't rob you of the peace because this peace surpasses your understanding. You can't even figure it out. It may not make sense to you, and certainly the world doesn't understand it. When they look at you Christians and they see that you're at peace and you're not stressed out and you're not worried and you are in this moment and this day comfortably relaxed and enjoying God and His presence and His power, even in the midst of a world that just seems to be flipped out, You are one who has the peace of God. They can't understand it. You don't know all the reasons why, but God is there and you are aware of it. Amen? And not only you are aware of it, this peace has a definite purpose. And he's going to use a military term here, and notice this term. It is going to guard your hearts and your minds. So understand this. If there's anything Satan wants to do, he wishes to rob you of peace. If there's anything he wants to do, he wants everybody stressed, anxious, feeling fearful, overcome with worry, overcome with anxiety, immobilized, and literally terrified. That's where he wants you to live. And Paul is saying, you need to understand something. We don't live there. We are a people who have the peace of our perfect God residing within us they look at us and it doesn't make sense we're not sure that we understand it other than this we know that God is in control of all things and this is my protection this is my guard this is what keeps me safe every single day it's a beautiful thing now the question is is you got to ask yourself how do I get this peace how do I Take this peace and make it mine. Well, that's what the Apostle Paul is going to teach you. And he's going to tell you three things this morning that you need to do. In fact, he's not just going to say them. He's going to command them. They are imperatives. He is saying, this is what I'm commanding you to do in Christ Jesus. You just don't sit back and say, oh, gee, I'm going to be at peace. No, there must be an active movement of your heart in your mind to engage these three things in order that you might obtain peace. Do you really want peace? Do you want it like nothing else in this world? I mean, that's what we talk about come Christmas time, isn't it? Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. 
Well, the kind of peace that we're looking for is the peace of God, the only kind of peace that He can give. Listen to what He says. Here it comes. He's going to give you these commands. Ready? First one, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say what? Rejoice. So that's your imperative. That's what He wants you to do. He's telling you, first of all, believers, rejoice. Then He's going to say this. Second thing, let your reasonableness be known, and this is the ad imperative, be known to everyone. So whatever reasonableness is, it is to be in my life, and not just in my life, but it is to be a demonstration in my life so other people can see it. So number one, rejoice, right? In fact, he emphatically says it again. Again, I'm going to say rejoice. That's the command. Second of all, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. We'll talk about what that means. The Lord is at hand. Verse 6, here comes another command. Don't be anxious. Do not be anxious. That's what he's saying. And you might want to say to yourself, wait a minute, that sounds kind of ridiculous. You're telling me to have the peace of God in with me, and I want this peace, and you're commanding me to have this peace, and yet in this peace that you're promising me that's going to free me of anxiety, you're saying don't be anxious. Yes, but it's more than that. So let's listen to what Paul has to say, shall we? First of all, understand this. He wants you to rejoice. Now remember, he wrote these words when he is in what? Prison. He's under house arrest. The gospel is not going out and he is not starting churches. It's spreading through other Christians. It's spreading through other communities. But he himself is under house arrest sitting there. And he's got to be wondering to himself, why am I here? Why do you got me doing this, Lord? Don't you realize that I could be out sharing my faith, starting other churches, and let you mobilize me? You've allowed me to be here in this place, and I'm stuck. And yet he says, it doesn't worry me a bit. I am going to rejoice in the Lord. In fact, this whole book that Paul is talking about in Philippians is all about rejoicing Notice what he said, chapter 1, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, and notice this, you all making my prayer with what? With joy. It's a recurrent theme throughout the book. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord, he says, in chapter 3, and then again here in chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord, again I will say rejoice. Paul is saying that you and I as believers need to engage in the active mental movement forward of rejoicing in God. He is commanding us to rejoice. He is commanding us to rejoice for what we have. Everything in this rejoicing is tied to the Lord. So he's not just saying be happy. He's saying rejoice how? In the Lord. How do you rejoice in the Lord? Well, one of the ways in which we rejoice in the Lord is when we look at the Lord and we begin to understand all of the matchless and mighty things that He has done for me. And when you look at who He is, the beauty of our Heavenly Father, the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot help but rejoice. You look at him and you are overwhelmed with his presence. You are in Christ and you are saying, now I am going to rejoice. And that's what God calls us to do. Just like Hannah did in the book of 1 Samuel. It says, Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your what? salvation just the very fact that he has saved you just the very fact that he loves you just the very fact that his grace is upon you you can begin to rejoice my favorite verse in all of the new testament if somebody was to ask me what my verse is it would be this verse i love this though you have not seen him peter is writing and saying you haven't seen jesus with your own eyes Those of you who are here today, this morning, you haven't seen him with your eyes. Though you have not seen him, what? You love him. You love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and what? 
Rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So without even having seen the Lord, you and I can sit back and rejoice because He loves us, He has saved us, and He has redeemed us. And if He loves you and He saved you and He's redeemed you, it doesn't really matter what happens to you in this world because everything is going to work out absolutely the way God intended it. And so you can rejoice. Even in the midst of the junk that's going on right now today, uh, my understanding is, and I only listened to the news for about 20 minutes, and I learned something very powerful. And that is that the news is not about giving you so much the information as it is so much about trying to impart in you a disposition and an attitude. They want you to worry. They want you to fear. And the reason is because when you're fear with fear and anxiety, you continue to watch the news, hoping that you're going to get some good news in it. They are not in the business of good news. They are in the business of, as they say in the newspaper business and in the TV industry, if it bleeds, it leads. And sometimes when we find ourselves glued to the television set, watching everything that is going on, it can be very discouraging. In the 30-minute newscast that I watched this week, there was nothing but doom and gloom across the whole country. And in that 30-minute newscast, there wasn't one person who said anything about a vaccine that is going to be available soon for people. They don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about how everybody's dying and how everybody's getting sick and how you're going to die. Well, if God chooses to take you out, he chooses to take you out. Christ is yours. What, what is the worst thing that can happen to you? The very worst. N nothing. <laughs> I mean, if Christ is mine, do I have anything to worry about? So why not do honor and glory to him by rejoicing? And saying thing. I read a little snippet out of the San Francisco Chronicle. They told us that this year we have to cancel Thanksgiving. We're just gonna we're gonna cancel Thanksgiving. I'm gonna tell you something. Paul's commandment for you today is not to cancel Thanksgiving, but to have Thanksgiving and rejoice in him always. Amen. That's what he says. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in Him. In fact, the psalmist says this, My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you and my soul which you have redeemed. He saved you. And so when He has saved you and redeemed you, shout for joy. Sing praises unto God because He loves us people. And I don't care what is going on. You think you might say, oh, this is, this is terrible. What We've never gone through anything like this in the world. What? Are you ignorant of history? Haven't you looked at the 13th century when the bubonic plague broke out in Florence, Italy and killed millions of people? This is nothing compared to that. And even in that day, believers were rejoicing in Christ. I read a testimony of a man who had the bubonic plague and it was the worst form. It was the systemic one, the one that goes into your bloodstream. And when you get that, they say this, you could be dancing in the morning and dying by nightfall because it usually killed you within 24 hours. And this man who had it gave a testimony. You know what he said? He said, guess what? In 24 hours, I'm going to go see my Savior. It is going to be the most glorious thing you've ever seen. Wow. There's a guy who's got a right perspective. That's the attitude that I want. I want no matter what happens, Lord, I am going to shout for joy. There's nobody like you. I have been redeemed. Even when the world does not see it and they do not understand it, I have the peace of God that passes all understanding residing in my heart. Let us shout for the Lord. Amen? Amen. Whew, praise God. Second thing he wants you to do. Now, this is the hard one. This is, I'm going to talk about your attitude. Okay? No bad attitudes, okay? This is a hard one for you. It's a hard one for me sometimes. Here's what he says. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. 
The idea of making it known is the imperative and what we're supposed to do, the adjective. Reasonableness. Now, some of your Bibles have the word gentleness. Some of your Bibles have the word uh, moderation. Different words are used here. Hard word to translate. It is one of those words that does not fit well into the English language. We have a difficult time putting it there. One person translates it this way. Let your selflessness be known to others. I like that. Let your selflessness be known to others. Uh, th that is the very opposite of my entitlement. Most of us look at our rights and we're eager to guard our rights. These are rights afforded to me by the Constitution. Yes, they are. And you have the right. But please understand, when it comes to your rights, the Bible at times tells us we must be willing to set aside our rights for our love for our brother and sister in Christ. In the context of chapter 4, two women in the church are at each other's throats. They're fighting. And Paul is exhorting Iodia and Syntyche and letting them know, you girls, stop it. Be of the same mind. And he is encouraging them to do that. And he is letting them know, you both need to surrender. You both need to give a little bit so you can meet the greater good of working together for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why in the church, we don't major on the minors. We are not going to fight in this church over the little things. We let the rule of love supremely govern us, even though we are very different people. And you're different from me. You are different. <laughs> you're all different than me. <laughs> Aren't you glad that you're different than me? But we're not going to let the differences come between us. We are going to be known that we set aside some of those differences for the greater good, the furtherance of the gospel, the joy of the Lord, and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm saying? Now hang on here. Here's a great way to describe what is taking place here and what Paul is exhorting us to. Remember our perfect example of this is Jesus for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. Here it comes, when he was reviled, when he was railed, he did not what? Did he not have the right to turn to those people who were saying horrible things about him? and smoke him right there? I mean, there's a day coming when he's going to do that. Don't get me wrong. But in his first advent, he didn't waste their face. He graciously did not revile, setting an example for us. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But what did he do? He continued entrusting himself to God who judges justly. In other words, he could have claimed his rights. He could have said to Pontius Pilate, I'm not only truth, let me show you something. Put the Darth Vader death grip on him. He could have done all that, but he did not. He voluntarily set aside his rights because he was the perfect son of God who did not revile and this is an example for us, an attitude. So when people insult you, when people say bad things about you, and by the way, that's going to happen next week on Thursday, Thanksgiving, when all your relatives come over, <laughs> you're not going to argue. And you're not going to fight. Quiet in here. Let me give you an example. I'm going to give you an example. I went to um, Trader Joe's, and I had to get some stuff, so I got the cart. They wiped it down, sanitized it, everything like that. you got to wear a mask when you go to Trader Joe's, so I put the mask on. And 
I got to admit, my attitude was not the best when I walked in the store. And so I wore my mask under my nose. And I'm walking around Trader Joe's with my mask under my nose thinking, <laughs> I got you guys. <laughs> and I think it was the manager. I don't know. But he walked by this way and he said this to me, get that mask over your nose. That's all he said. At that moment, when he said that, <laughs> Greg was filled with hate and anger. Greg, you, you need to be listening to this message is what I'm saying. <laughs> I did. I flashed up in anger. I let go of the cart that was filled with groceries, and I thought to myself, I'm just going to leave it here and let you put it away. I've come into your store. Who are you to tell me what to do? You don't tell me what to do. I'm a customer. And as far as I'm concerned, the customer is always. Well, you could be right and you can be wrong. And my attitude was definitely saying something. My reasonableness was not known to everyone at that moment. <laughs> so I begrudgingly pulled the mask up over my nose one of the problems that I have with it is that if you wear glasses like I do, this is the, uh, that's how you walk around the store. I can't see anything. And I can't see people's faces, and I like to see people smile. But the Lord spoke to me at that moment, and he said, let your reasonableness be known, Mike. I did, changed my attitude, said to the Lord, forgive me. I, I need to be doing what is right here to honor and give glory to you because you're my utmost concern. And so I finished my shopping. I was moving around to the other side, coming down the other aisle. The same guy that just walked past uh, me earlier and told me to get my mask on was coming towards me. And my cart just... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> It, it, did, it didn't do that. <laughs> it wanted to do that. One of the wheels was stuck. <laughs> it, it didn't do that. And I stopped by, and he came right past me again. And you know what he said? He said, thank you, Pastor Mike. <laughs> I don't shop at Trader Joe's anymore at all. I... I don't know who it is, but somebody over there knew me. <laughs> and I'm glad that I didn't hit him with the cart, and I'm glad I didn't yell at him. <laughs> and I'm glad my reasonableness in Christ constrained me. Aren't you glad? <laughs> You'd be bailing me out at a jail. But praise God. Praise God. Amen? Now hang on. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. That can mean one of two things. This can mean, number one, the Lord is coming back soon, or the Lord is at hand. He's watching everything that you do. And you know what? Both are true, right? Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Huh? Or there's a father up above who is looking down in love. Be careful, little eyes. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. Huh? You got Thanksgiving coming up. You're going to be talking about coronavirus i know you will you're going to be talking about the election <laughs> you're going to go all kinds of places and here's what i'm saying now is not the time to argue and fight just let it go just let it go you're going to get so keyed up over that, you're going to lose the moment that God has intended you to have with your family, filled with rejoicing and thanksgiving. Let them see the graciousness and reasonableness of your heart that you love Christ, right? Just be super flexible. Do whatever you want to do and make it your goal this Thanksgiving to get out of everything that I want and turn to your wife and say, honey, what can I do for you? Would you like me to wash the dishes? All right, next point. <laughs> Aren't you glad that's not in the Bible, huh? <laughs> but we want to be gracious, don't we? Yes, we do. We want to be kind. We want to be helpful. 
And so just remember, as I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to me as well. Now, third thing he's going to tell you, another imperative. First one is rejoice always, right? Rejoice in the Lord. Second one is let my reasonableness be known to others. You see, letting my reasonableness be known to myself doesn't mean anything. I mean, every time I've gotten an argument with somebody and I've replayed the argument in my mind after it happens, I win every argument because I think I'm reasonable. But here it is. The goal is to make my reasonableness known to everyone. Big difference, right? Thirdly, do not be anxious. That word anything is not in the Greek. No, it is in the Greek, people. That's the problem. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, here's what's really odd. He's telling me to have the peace of God in him. I want the peace of God. And I don't want anxiety. And now he's telling me how to have the peace of God in my life. And he's saying to me, here's how you have the peace of God in your life and not be anxious is to not be anxious. Is that all there is to this? Just don't be anxious? Just go to the record player and put on the song. Well, we don't have record players anymore, do we? <laughs> go, <laughs> go to Pandora or whatever you use and play the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Is that what Paul's saying? Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Hang on. A negative prohibition, but with a positive direction. Watch it. Here it comes. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, I want you to do something. I want you to pray. I want you to take every request and supplication that you have to God. I want you to take those requests that you have and make them known to God. And here's the attitude that I want to permeate everything that you do with thanksgiving. Do you see it? I like what D.A. Carson said. He said, the way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. So the whole time, I am in an active moment, not passive, not just sitting there saying, don't worry, be happy. I am in the active presence of everything in my prayers, in my supplications, in my request, making them known to God. My attitude is one of complete gratitude and thanksgiving to God. Do you see that? Why thanksgiving? Because when there's thanksgiving, you are actively recalling to your mind all of the good works that God has done for you since the day you were born. And I'm going to say this. He has never once failed you, let you down, allowed a mistake to happen in your life. He has cared for you cons constantly and consistency. Even in the most difficult struggles in your life, he has always been there. And so he wants you to say, whatever I'm going through and the anxiety that I am experiencing, because what is anxiety? It's about me worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. He says, you don't need to be anxious about it. You don't need to be anxious about food. You don't need to be anxious about clothes. You don't need to be anxious about your disease. You don't need to be anxious about the day you're going to die sometime. You want to know why? Because he's never failed you. And focus on his great faithfulness unto you with great thanksgiving in your heart. And the moment that you do that, your mind is filled and flooded with the peace of God. This is what Paul is instructing us to do. It's a beautiful thing. I got a chance years ago to fellowship and to have a friend in my life by the name of Chris Pickens. Some of you remember Chris. Chris is home with Jesus. He had ALS, right? We call it Lou Gehrig's syndrome. And for anybody who has that disease, you know what the outcome is sooner or later. They're, the way that it's described to me is that the body no longer functions the way it should. The, the receptors and the nerves and all that thing starts to happen. Muscles atrophy and eventually your lungs fail you. 
and you die. And I was there when Chris died. We gathered around and we were praying over him and thanking God for him and worshiping the Lord with thanksgiving for allowing this beautiful brother to be in our life and thanking God for our friendship. But Chris told me about the day that he first was diagnosed. He found out he had ALS. He didn't have sporadic. He had familiar ALS, which means it's the same thing, only spread out over a long period of time. And I think he lived, what was it, close to 20 years with it. And so as he was slowly deteriorating, I said, what was it like the first day you found out? He said, the first day I found out, I, I, w I wasn't surprised because I had felt symptoms in my body. I had known it because my grandmother had it. Several other people in my family had it. So I was aware that I might get it. It might be something that is passed down to me hereditarily. And sure enough, it was. And so I called my pastor that day. And I said, I, I need to see you. Can I see you? The pastor said, sure, come on by. They went to his office. Pastor had a word of prayer with him, said, what's on your heart? He, he told him, he says, I have ALS. It's not looking good. Uh, eventually, I'm going to die of this thing. The pastor says, okay, I need you to come with me. So the pastor got him. They got in their car, and the pastor drove them across town, just him and the pastor, pulled in to a cemetery. Chris got out, pastor got out, pastor walked over to the graves that were there, and the pastor said to him, that's what he said, I want you to know you have this disease, and this is where you're going to end up. Really? You know what Chris said to the pastor? Well, you're mistaken. Oh, if you mean my body's going to be here, sure. But I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be with my Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hear what he's saying? He was beginning in his mind at that moment for the next 20 years to do battle with the enemy who was trying to say to him, you're dying. And he said, glory to God. I'm going to thank him for everything that comes into my life. I'm going to praise him, and no matter what transpires, praise be to God. That's the way I want to live my life. Because if the Lord doesn't come, I'm going to be over at the Pastor Oval Cemetery. But that's just the outer shell of my garment. That's just my body. My bones are just going to rest there. That's all they're doing. My spirit, the moment I die, says that I go to be with the presence of my heavenly Father. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And people, this ain't paradise. <laughs> I like Paso Robles, but it ain't it. In this world right now, I'm a chubby little short guy with diabetes. You wait to see me when I'm in glory with my Father. And you really want to see something happen? You wait on that day when he decides to come back for his people. And Paul says that those bodies in the grave that are rotten and have turned to dust and have decayed will suddenly be reanimated with a brand new body. My spirit is going to now dwell inside of a brand new body. What is remarkable about this is Paul says that those dead in Christ, that's those who have died, that's those who have been buried, that's those who were Baptists, dead in Christ. We're going to rise first. And then those who are alive and remaining, should you be here, you will then be caught up. And in the twinkling of an eye, your body will be changed. And what a day that is going to be. And so... I'm not going to be anxious about anything. What's the point? There is no point. Everybody, and especially Satan, wants to steal your joy. He wants to rob it. He wants to take it away from you. He wants you to have the worst Thanksgiving. 
not true with God. He wants you to rejoice in Him. Bring to your active memory all of the good things that God has done, that God will do, that God is going to do. And rejoice in Him for that day when you will be together with all the people of God. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. You see, thanksgiving people literally calls me to faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. He's asking me to trust him with the future, which is faith. Trust in him with the future because everything that he's done in the past. And not only that, but thanksgiving is the dear mark of every Christian. Did you realize you will not be a successful Christian without thanksgiving in your heart. Can't happen. Do you remember the story of the ten lepers that were crying out to Jesus in Luke 17? Son of God, Son of David, heal us, heal us. And Jesus walked over to those ten lepers and totally removed the worst disease that was plaguing them at that time, leprosy. And what is astonishing is that out of the ten that God healed, only one came back. And do you remember what Jesus said? Were there not ten that were healed? Only one of you come back and he's a Samaritan Gentile? Jesus said, go, your faith has made you well. Well, 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 didn't the other ten get, uh, the other nine get healed? Yes, they did. They got healed. But I don't think they got saved. It's the guy who came back and said, thank you. That's why he said, your faith has made you well. He's not just talking about his physical disease. He's talking about spiritually. You have now been made well. Because when you have been touched by the Lord Jesus Christ, there is something that always happens There is a spirit of gratitude that permeates everything that we've done. When I've been touched by His Spirit, anxiety is pushed away. When I've been touched by His Spirit, my reasonableness is known to everyone. When I have been touched by His Spirit and redeemed, there is a joy that comes to me unlike anything else, and I'm found always rejoicing, even when I'm crying. Now let me ask you, what do you want? Do you want the peace of God? I do. And so I'm going to rejoice always. I'm going to be gracious, considerate, and kind towards other people and let my reasonableness be known. And I'm going to be a man of constant prayer filled with thanksgiving and gratitude in my heart, thanking God for every good thing that has come my way. Amen. Father in heaven, bless your people today. Help us, Lord. May we actively go to battle. I know the evil one wants to steal our joy. He'd love to reduce our thanksgiving to nothing more than embattlement and arguments and fights. But we're going to guard our hearts and our minds with the peace of God. And we are going to celebrate this week and throughout this whole season your goodness and your love. Thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.
Wow, that was beautiful. I'm not sure I've ever heard that before. That was that song. That was gorgeous. And Mike, I have to tell you what, that was one awesome preaching breath, eternal life. No, seriously. Amen. I'm telling you what, it was it just flat out kicking the pants. I almost got up and danced. I <laughs> I just could hardly sit. Okay. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, thank you. Seriously. Uh, men and women of God, you, this ought to be the most fantastic Thanksgiving you've ever had. This is the day the Lord has made, and talk about rejoicing, and no anxiety given to us at all. We just naturally give thanks and everything. And I love, I love that idea, what you did, Mike, about reasonableness. Our, our, the NIV says gentleness, but even that, and it was so beautiful that you were able to be, have a wonderful story about being in, you know, <laughs> because you need to know, none of us have ever had that problem in this story. <laughs> Now, my wife had it in Costco <laughs> with the stuff in the church. She said, leave it here. We're out of here. <laughs> it was so fun. I, I tell you what, thank you, Mike, truly. Men and women of God, aren't you just glad you were here? Aren't you just glad to hear the eternal blessing? Aren't you glad that God has anointed you and loves you continually, always and forever, and that he has his plan? May this Thanksgiving be the best you've ever had. May it be one of great celebration. May all things be purified in the blood of Christ and rejoicing in him. So may the Lord bless you on this day. When you leave here, leave with gladness of heart. Thanks for being here. Pastor Mike, again, thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you.